In the next Shed Science, I'll explain why Bill Hamilton rules and when altruism is the best strategy. I suppose I'd better get on with it then, hadn't I? Don't worry, I've brought chocolate. <laughs> Animals interact all the time. Most of the time they'll be competing over access to food, territories or mates. But sometimes they'll cooperate with each other, keeping an eye out for danger or helping out with looking after the kids. All of these social interactions are adaptations and have therefore passed the test of natural selection. As I mentioned in my selfish gene video, Evolutionary success, also known as fitness, was once thought to be only making more offspring, whereas nowadays fitness is seen to be making more genes. But it's very difficult to measure how adaptations affect the replication of genes, whereas it's actually quite easy to measure how adaptations affect reproduction and the number of offspring you make. And the vast majority of the time, changes in gene frequency occur through making more or fewer offspring, either my own offspring or those of a relative. So can we come up with a way of working out how adaptations affect the replication of genes, but by only measuring the number of offspring and not having to splash out thousands and millions of pounds on the latest genome sequencing technologies? Hamilton realized you can. You will very quickly realize as I make more of these videos on evolution that in my eyes, Hamilton is a god. A bit like Darwin, but with less of the Victorian waffly prose. Hamilton came up with the idea of inclusive fitness. If an adaptation increases your inclusive fitness, it will be an evolutionary success and will spread through the population. So what is this inclusive fitness I hear you ask? Well, Hamilton defined it as the total production of adult offspring, stripped of all components that can be considered as due to an individual social environment, is augmented by the certain fractions of harm and benefit that the individual himself causes to the fitness of his neighbours. The fractions of the question is simply the coefficients of relatedness. Yes! What a mouthful! Although, finally, I can make use of learning that definition for my university exams. Anyway, let's break it down. In the game of life, each player starts off with a certain number of offspring they can expect to make in their lifetime. This number is dependent on your traditional non-social adaptations, like how big you are, how good you are at fighting diseases, how good you are at not being eaten by predators. Two players can also interact, and as I mentioned before, interactions can increase and decrease the number of offspring of both the actor doing the action and the recipient receiving the action. We're interested in altruistic interactions because these are the types of interactions that couldn't have been explained by the traditional Darwinian model of fitness. Altruism is when the actor loses out and the recipient gains. For example, giving away the bar of chocolate that I've been looking forward to all day will make me hungry and less nourished, so I lose one potential offspring that I would have been able to make had I not given away this chocolate. The recipient, on the other hand, may have been close to passing out with hunger, and so the one bar of chocolate is worth more to her, and she is now able to produce two more offspring that she wouldn't have been able to do without the chocolate. We say that the cost of this action to me, C, is 1, and the benefit to you, B, is 2. We can measure these changes in two ways. First, we can say that I have my original 4 minus 1 and you have your original two plus two. This is neighbor modulated fitness because your new fitness of four has been modulated, has been influenced by me, your neighbor. But if someone else is influencing your fitness, your fitness therefore isn't entirely under your control. And if you can't control your own fitness, you certainly can't adapt to increase it. So that's not a very useful measure of fitness at all. On the other hand, we could say that I have my original four minus one of mine and plus two of yours, whereas you just have your original two. You can see that this still accounts for all of the consequences of the interaction. But here, the actor, me, performing the action, I'm in control of the action and I'm also in control of the changes in fitness, which is really important. But what am I supposed to do with two of your offspring? 
Going back to thinking about evolution in terms of genes, if we're related, then chances are some of the genes in me will likely be in you and your offspring. The more related we are, the more genes we share. So there's almost an exchange rate. I share 100% of my genes with myself. Surprise, surprise. And so helping me is identical to helping me. You'll see where this is going in a second. So I give myself an exchange rate of one. My full sister, on the other hand, on average, we share 50% of our genes. And so I give her an exchange rate of 0.5. Helping her is like helping me, but only half as much. I could trade in two of her offspring and receive one of my offspring in return, and we'd break even genetically. And there are exchange rates for every single conceivable relationship you can imagine. And these are the coefficients of relatedness, R, that Hamilton mentioned in his definition of inclusive fitness. I will add here, in case my tutor or any other evolutionary biologists are watching, that when I say I share 50% of my genes with my sister, I, strictly speaking, mean I share 50% of my genes over and above the population average. But I'll leave the intricacies of relatednesses, yes, that is a word, and how you calculate them to another video. So back to the original question. When should I be altruistic? We've got to weigh at the cost to me, C, against the benefit to you, B, but factoring in that exchange rate, R. If the benefits outweigh the costs, i.e. if RB is greater than C, this means that overall the gene is going to replicate itself more and there'll be more copies of it in the gene pool. And this means that more individuals are going to start sharing their chocolates or whatever else the trait may be. With the most basic of algebra, to just to make it look a bit more pretty, we can rearrange that and say that an action or any other trait will be successful evolutionarily and will spread if it increases the individual's inclusive fitness, i.e. if RB minus C is greater than zero. And this is Hamilton's rule. And this is why Hamilton rules. Oh yeah. Okay, so it's a cheesy pun, but seriously, inclusive fitness and this rule revolutionised biology. Before, we could only clearly think about the non-social interactions, i.e. when R is zero, and here the trait must benefit the individual selfishly. But now we can expand and think about the social side of things, which includes some of the most fascinating areas of biology, such as why bees cooperate in a hive, or why meerkats stand in that cute little line, or why I'm more likely to pay for biscuits if I think someone's watching me. Or even, think about this one, why the cells in my body are cooperating with each other and not fighting it out selfishly like a cancer does. It's all Hamilton's rule. Thanks for watching this Shed Science. Shed Science is back! And if you want to, you can subscribe or follow me on Twitter to find out when I post the next one. If I promise you anything, I promise it's I'm not going to be posting regularly. And as always, keep smiling.